Today on Women of Impact, the licensed clinical psychologist, Dr. Ramani, is in the hot seat and revealing exactly what not to do when you come face to face with a narcissist. You don't want to serve up your pain to somebody who's going to melt it into bullets. And why it can be incredibly harmful. And I have watched people be destroyed having people take those vulnerabilities they shared with someone and having them be used against them in all kinds of terrible ways. Whether it's a narcissistic partner, parent or friend, today's guest, a professor of psychology, a distinguished speaker and a sought after expert with appearances on Red Table Talk, CNN, Oprah, Forbes and New York Times to name a few, breaks down exactly why having it out with them is the worst idea possible. Ah. When you're having an argument with a narcissistic person or whatever it is, email battle or text battle, whatever, they don't pause, they reload. And instead guides us on exactly what we should do instead. Don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, and don't personalize. Oh, that was a ton of bricks right there. So guys, get ready as we're about to dive in the deep end of the narcissistic pool. Oh girl, that was so fire. With today's swim instructor, the notorious narcissist expert herself, Dr. Remini. It's so nice to see you and see you. I know. So I'm so happy to be back. You are honestly back by popular demand, girl. Oh, good. People were hounding me. When are you going to get her back on the show? The first time we sat together, um, we spoke about what a narcissist was. Yeah. We really broke it down in detail. And the one thing I got a lot from that interview is when you know that someone is now a narcissist, how do you communicate yeah. with them? Mm -hmm. Do you leave them? Do you break up with them? What if mm -hmm. it's a parent? Mm -hmm. What if it's a partner? Yeah. So I was like, all right, you've got to come back and I want to go deep. Mm -hmm. And so I started watching your content. Mm -hmm. And one of the videos you said that really hit me, and this is where I want to start. Mm -hmm. How as kids we're taught sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt. And how that has set us up mm -hmm. as adults for utter disaster. Yes, it has. I'm so glad you picked that video because it was interesting. You know, sticks and stones can break my bones. Words will never hurt me. I'm thinking words are what's hurting people more than the sticks and stones. I think some people feel like beat me with a stick, but please stop. Stop criticizing me. Stop undermining me. Stop invalidating me. I can handle that other piece. And obviously we don't want either, but we underestimate the harm words can do. And what ends up happening is when a person is getting chronically emotionally and verbally abused, or like I said, gaslighted, invalidated in a relationship, a lot of times they don't get empathy or support from other people. They say, oh, come on, it's not like they're beating you up. Oh, come on, it's not like they're, you know, doing this, like something physical. And I'm thinking, this is the stuff that breaks a psyche. And because you can't, a, a broken psyche doesn't look like a bruise or a black eye, but rather it's a far deeper wound, it gets missed. So yeah, you better believe words hurt you. And in fact, that's how people get injured as children. That's how people get injured in the workplace, certainly in their intimate relationships, in their family relationships. 90% of the time, it's words. God, yeah, when I heard you say that, I was like, wow, it's so true. Because if someone sees a bruise, immediately they're like, oh my God. And you say, yes, they've been beating me. 100%, someone's gonna act on it, try and help you, or you hope. But when it comes to words, like you said, you get dismissed. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. So let's talk about then the words that narcissists do use mm -hmm. and how to respond to them. Do you respond to them? Right. How to walk away mm -hmm. and how to handle those situations. Let's take yeah. a partner. Okay, so the challenge here becomes, Lisa, is that it's almost like we have to start at a foundational level, right? People have to respect and believe in their own reality and respect and believe in themselves because otherwise you're vulnerable mm -hmm. to someone's words, right? When they're going at you, they're telling you you're incompetent. You don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. You know, who do you think you are? And all this other stuff that leaves a person feeling like they're not enough or that maybe that other person is right, not them. So all of that is foundational work that most mm -hmm. people never do. Then you're in this relationship where somebody is speaking to you in these sort of dismissive, gaslighty, manipulative sorts of ways. There's a moment, and this is the challenge, is that for months, if not years, people believe what that person is saying to them. They actually believe that they're all those bad things or they're not enough or they're asking too much or whatever it is, whatever their, their partner's going after them for. But there's a moment, 
when it's a penny drop moment. Maybe it's a someone's gaslighted you. They've completely denied your reality. And on a strange day, you actually record it and you play it back. You're like, no, I did hear it right. And then over time, you start saying, my reality is actually right. And one of the things I say, I give all, I get, I use this a lot in my teaching about narcissism. I call it the deep technique. And deep stands for don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, and don't personalize. And if you can hold on to those four rules, which are not simple rules, they're hard rules, but don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, don't personalize. Don't defend is when somebody is saying you did something and you didn't do it, don't defend it. There's no point, you know, because now what happens is you start going down the rabbit hole. And the don't engage part really means that you pull back quite a bit. You recognize that I'm always walking on eggshells. No matter how I say this, I get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And the don't personalize piece is this is them. It's not you. And especially the don't personalize piece, that's hard for people. They think it's got to be me. And I'm like, no, it's not you. If anything, you're so empathic that you're easy to take advantage of because they know you're going to keep coming back. So having those four simple rules, and those would apply to any kind of relationship. I also tell people it's incredibly important to have other voices in your life, mm -hmm. other supports, whether that's friends, colleagues, family members, whoever your people are. What you start seeing is that all these other people are saying, I'm solid, I'm good, I'm kind, I'm competent. One person mm -hmm. only is saying these things, you know, and w which side you're going to go on. And what makes it harder is if people heard these negating messages in childhood. So because then the narcissistic partner comes along and they're basically reinforcing these messages of I'm not enough from childhood. That's a very, that, that cycle of defending and rationalizing someone who's saying you're not enough, something we call trauma bonding. Mm -hmm. You actually justify the narcissistic person and that's a cycle that started in childhood. The child doesn't have an option. The parent they got, the parent they got. So they will justify that. And so a lot of it is about no longer doing the dance. L let's face it, Lisa, a lot of people can't leave these relationships for reasons of kids, money, culture, religion, and I never discount those reasons. Those reasons are very real, and it's not for someone to say, well, you just gotta get out. When you say that to people, they say, well, I can't get out, so this all feels helpless and hopeless. I'd written a book called Should I Stay or Should I Go? And I wrote that book because I know about half of people stay. Sometimes because they have to, sometimes because they haven't hit their rock bottom in it, whatever their reason is. So you don't have to rationalize your reason to me. Let's give you tools mm -hmm. to stay. And that's the things like don't overengage, don't defend yourself, don't go down the rabbit hole. See that this is their sort of very limited ability, their lack of empathy, their entitlement. It's not yours. You're good. And by doing that, sometimes people can find the workarounds. It's not good for a person. I mean, in the long run, I think it's probably healthier to step away, but that's just not an option. People don't want to step away from relationships all the time. Ooh, girl, that was so mm -hmm. fun. It's a okay, lot. So I want to go deep on the deep thing. Mm -hmm. um, so in those moments, mm -hmm. when you say don't defend, mm -hmm. at least for me, I remember I didn't defend because I was weak, mm. because I was insecure. Yeah. So I didn't have the mm -hmm. confidence to defend myself. Mm -hmm. And so as I started to build my confidence, I started to go, no, defending yourself is, you know, stand up for yourself. Right. So in what you're saying is don't defend, I actually get why, but how do you reconcile then right. the I'm doing it because it's the right thing versus am I not defending, am I not speaking up for myself? Right, and that right there is one of the biggest tricky bits here because people say, I feel like I've become a doormat and right. I'm kind of giving in. Yes. I said, but here's the, it's, it becomes strategic. It becomes intentional. This isn't about capitulating. This isn't about being a doormat. This is about saying, I'm not getting into, I'm not going to do this toxic dance with this person. Because in essence, Lisa, when you get into that toxic dance with somebody who has a really antagonistic, narcissistic personality, you're giving them exactly what they want. Mm. They want to get in the mud. I'm telling people, don't get in the mud. Defending oneself when, for example, they're misheard or misunderstood in a healthy relationship is totally appropriate. So a person says, hey, da, 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 why didn't you just say, listen, I put all the papers on your desk on the deadline. You didn't get to them. I get that, but I did do this. And in a healthy relationship, person say, oh my goodness, yes, you did. I'm so sorry. Appropriate, okay? What gets challenging with the narcissistic relationships in our lives is you almost have to have two sets of strategies. One set of strategies you maintain in your healthy relationship and a different toolkit 
in the narcissistic relationships. So you need to know when to engage and when not to engage. And I call that discernment. It's discerning how to be with the healthy folks and how to be with the unhealthy folks. Two sets of tools. Wow. You would not take a tennis racket to go play baseball. <laughs> That's such good advice. Okay, so w let's assume that somebody is either with a narcissist or has mm -hmm. someone in their life. Um, I know that you have almost like certain rules that you advise mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. So there's one phrase that you use, which is um, don't give your psychological passwords to them. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about yeah. that? So it's actually a brilliant, again, I always I make sure that so many of this, so much of this is accumulated wisdom. There's actually somebody I've worked with who said to me, instead of calling it gray rocking, why don't you call it firewalling? Somebody who works in the tech industry. And I thought, interesting, say more. And we talked about it. And her husband's a big tech guy. And, and we find, I said, this is, you're absolutely brilliant. Because when you think about a firewalled computer, right? It's very restrictive on what it lets in, right? It'll say, this is, this is a virus, don't let this in. And it's also very restrictive on what you let out. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll even ask you, are you sure? I say don't, part of firewalling is you would, I wouldn't give you all my passwords. I adore you, but I wouldn't give you all my passwords, <laughs> right? That's if you did. Right, yes, exactly. And so we don't hand, we're so, we're literally more protective of the password we have for some game on our computer than we are with the most sacred parts of our psyche. I'm like, what you know i mean that doesn't even make but that's it doesn't make sense but everyone does that they just hand it over and so this idea is that you wouldn't just give away your normal passwords don't give away your psychological passwords your deep vulnerabilities your because i'll tell you why they'll use them against you narcissistic people will always weaponize your vulnerabilities so a lot of times early in a relationship people open up and they share their vulnerabilities Something that's really, really sinister about narcissistic relationships is during that love bombing phase, they'll look at someone and say, tell me, tell me the thing you least like about yourself. And you're like, ooh, we're sharing. They're putting that in some sort of evil vault in their brain that then when either you're in the devaluing cycle or the discarding cycle, you're having an argument, they'll pull that vulnerability out. It could be about anything. It could be about body image. It could be about something that happened to you in childhood. It could be about your family, a dream you have, and they will use it against you. And for a lot of people, it feels like the air has been sucked out of them. The most vulnerable thing that a person could share, they've shared with them. And it's like, in fact, in, in a cult structure, it's often called collateral. Like it's like I'm, we're gonna get, we've got to get something from them so we can almost blackmail someone wow. down the road. It's like that, maybe not at that level, but it's it's that ability to say, now I've got something on you, so I know I can hurt you. Mm. And so that's what I mean about don't hand away your psychological passwords. Don't give away those most vulnerable parts of yourself until someone really gains that trust. People might be sitting there saying, well, doesn't that? Are you telling people not to be vulnerable? Oh, absolutely not. I'm saying learn your people. Again, it's that two sets of ways of engaging in the world. And it's about taking a moment to get to know someone. If red flags are coming up, pay attention and hold back. You will get to the vulnerabilities. If this is a healthy person, you'll get there. But you don't need to get there in the first week. But I think so many people want to be heard and seen and understood that they rush to that moment of like, let me tell them everything and now we're in love. And I have watched people be destroyed having people take those vulnerabilities they shared with someone and having them be used against them in all kinds of terrible ways. Yeah, I very much believe that vulnerability should never be weaponized mm -hmm. in yeah, absolutely any situation. Not. Mm -mm. But I do understand that other people accidentally may use a vulnerability mm -hmm. in a heated moment and then regret it. So is it how they then handle it afterwards that right. dictates which... Yeah. Well, I'm not asking anyone to here to be superhuman. You know, we've all done it. You've done it. I've done it in a moment. You know, we've said something and say, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. It is that very rapid attempt at making amends, doing the reparations, and not doing it again. Mm -hmm. Right? You see what I'm saying? So you can't just keep doing it. Because one thing narcissistic relationships often consist of is the apologize cycle. It's like the rinse, lather, repeat. Like, I'm sorry. Oh, and they do it again. I'm sorry. Do it again. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I'll give you one, you know, saying I never should have said something like that. Then don't do it again. Mm -hmm. And when they do it again, it feels like then I'm sorry. It's just like a get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. Like, OK, I'm just going to use this again. And so it really it, it it's it's the intent and it's how quickly the reparations take place that a person immediately says, 
I had no, no place doing that. And I got to tell you, Lisa, in some cases, there are no fly zones. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm a parent, for example. You say anything to me, you go after my kids, we're done. <laughs> we're done. And when I work with clients, I tell them, it's okay to have those no-fly zones. It's because some say, I'm being too extreme, right? I'm like, oh, do I really shut someone off? You, I said, you're okay with doing that. If they went to a place that feels sacred to you, that feels untouchable to you, and it went there, that's abuse. That's a violation of a primal boundary. It's okay to say never again. Mm. Does that apply to everyone in your life, like your parents as well as a partner? It gets tricky there, Lisa, because I think, especially if you had a narcissistic parent, one of the most painful legacies of a narcissistic parent is that they do. They will use those vulnerabilities against a child. One thing I've classically heard with narcissistic parents and their children is they go after appearance. They go after weight. They go after how someone mm -hmm. looks. They, um, because it is a superficial personality style, right? And they often want their child to be a reflection of how they want to be in the world. And if it may not be straightly appearance, it might even be things like an ability. It might be things like soccer or school or whatever it may be, right? And so in those cases, the parent knowing that the child struggles with whatever will actually use that as a way to manipulate the child or get the child to do what they want. And then the child sort of lives in this sadness, like, or they'll try to be what the parent wants them to be. The kid will say, oh, if I could play tennis really well, then my parent would pay attention. And maybe they're just not a natural tennis player. And then the child really goes out and tries to hit a tennis ball or whatever. And then the parent's like, oh, really? Like, you want me to waste my time playing tennis with you? Like, this is way below me thinking like, oh my gosh, this poor kid's killing themselves to get you to notice them. But this will fast forward into adulthood. They will continue to do this to their child in adulthood. Parents are tricky. Narcissistic parents are tricky because a lot of people, for example, may love one parent and really have had a difficult other parent. Some people will feel as though really had a difficult parent, but I love my siblings, I love my grandparents. So, th And those other people in the system don't want you to distance from that one parent. I always say to people, once you identify the difficult people in the system, you can still be in that system, but you've got to be mindful. So it really does about maybe limiting the time, finding a time away from the narcissistic parent to be with those other people like your grandparent or your sibling or your other parent or whatever. And also to recognize you were the child, they were the parent, they dropped the ball. It's not your job to go back there and teach them. And I think a lot of people, continue. I've seen 50 year old people still be hoop jumping to get or, and, and trying to show off for a parent no different than a six-year-old trying to juggle in the living room just to get their parents to notice them mm -hmm. it doesn't stop but the hurt that a narcissistic parent can inflict on an adult child is just as potent as if that person was five years old Ooh, have you noticed the correlation between people that have had narcissistic parents that then go for a narcissistic mm -hmm. partner? Yeah, there's an incredible vulnerability. And I talk about this. I talk about people who have sort of are narcissism magnets mm. without knowing it. Like, And mm. one of the things on that list of magnets is exactly what you're saying, having come from a system characterized by this. There's a couple of reasons. One of the most intoxicating, tragically intoxicating things a person can experience is familiarity. When we say, ooh, we have a magical connection and I'm having a deja vu, I kind of put my head in my hand saying, no, 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 this is not good for you because the things that are familiar to you are actually quite toxic and poisonous. Mm -hmm. And that sort of familiarity of, for example, it's, it's something we call working through. I couldn't win over my narcissistic father, but I'm going to win over this guy. Ah. Right? And yeah, so then yeah. they go right into that same cycle. And because it's so familiar, it's almost hard to get that bit, that that view to say this isn't healthy for me or to get out mm -hmm. because the whole life almost becomes this activity of trying to get this um, to trying to do all the things I'm going to jump through the hoops I'm going to win this time and a lot of times people will convince themselves like if I can get it right here then it'll be okay then I would have I would have you know sort of figured out what I needed to figure out from childhood but the fact of the matter is this adult narcissistic person is going to treat you as badly as your narcissistic mm. parent and this time it's going to get uglier because it'll be things like the gaslighting and the manipulation and the rage and for some people that inner dialogue i'm not enough i'm not good enough i um i have no right to be doing this who am i to be pursuing my dreams i need to stay in my lane 
all of that stuff, that kind of inner dialogue, when it gets reinforced by a partner, people actually really get stuck in relationships. That's what I was going to say. You just listed a few. Um, can you repeat those actually? And what mm -hmm. are the things that, it's actually interesting, it never dawned on me that this is the language we say to ourselves, I'm mm -hmm. not enough. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. Is that the same language that a narcissist would also say to you as like a red flag? Absolutely. Like if they say to you, stay in your lane. Absolutely. They say, stay in your lane. You should. And you know what it is? It's, it's, a, it's more, ma they do it more masterfully than that. They plant just enough of a seed of doubt that you're the one who ends up cultivating that seed. Mm. So they'll say things like, yeah, really, that job? Like, okay, you know, I get why you'd want to do it, but you sure that's not you getting ahead of yourself? So it's just enough like, okay, go ahead and do it, but you sure about that? That's the kind of thing that they'll do. So now this thing you thought you could do, already they've put this new seed of doubt in there or saying, you know, things like, well, I don't know, other people at that job, they seem to have gone to some really fancy universities. Like, it's cool that they want you, but you sure about that? And then for many people, that's when they'll give up on themselves. Yeah. Can you actually truly be happy in a narcissistic relationship? Because not sharing your vulnerabilities with someone, not listening when they give you advice because you don't trust them, because you're worried that they're trying, oh, you sure you should go for that job? Like, I really want to be able to take my husband's advice for true advice. Mm -hmm. And so not being able to share that, not being able to, um, I've heard you say that um, um, not to share your wins with your a no, narcissist. No, not your wins, not your losses, and not your vulnerabilities. Don't share any of them. Okay, so I want to go down that actually not sharing the wins, but um, if you don't mind, like, can you actually then truly be mm. happy? It's such, a, it's such an, it's almost a philosophical question, yeah, isn't it, it really right? Is. I don't know that a person would ever be fully happy or satisfied or nourished in that relationship. Mm. I have seen people, amazingly so, figure out workarounds where they derive, I don't know, joy from their kids, their pets, their hobbies, their jobs, their other supports in their world. If, if provided the narcissistic person in their life isn't super controlling. Mm -hmm. Obviously all of that gets very difficult if the narcissistic person has someone on a really sort of a short tie to say like, you can't do this, you can't do that, and really isolates them from that world. When that dynamic is in place, I do not think it's possible to be happy. But if you're in a situation where you're kind of able to do some things that matter to you, I've seen people sort of carve out moments of happiness, but if this person's a day-to-day -day fixture in someone's life, not so much. I mean, mm -hmm. I do think it takes a toll and I've worked with people who've been in these relationships 30, 40, 50 years, and it hollows them out. Is that inevitable? I do think it's somewhat inevitable. How many times are you going to be invalidated? How many times is somebody going to w walk around in the world and feel completely unmirrored in what is to be a loving relationship? And especially if they aren't able to build up those other spaces in their lives. Some people figure out the workarounds and they recognize like, okay, this is not what I would have loved for myself or wanted for myself but I will try to make the most out of what I can. And then they take almost a very existential point of view. This moment's mm. beautiful, I'll be in mm. this moment kind of thing. And so they do their best at sort of deriving the joy from a given moment here. And it's, it's, again, that's a sort of high level existential work. It's hard to do because you look around at other people and they are in love and their partners are appreciative of them mm. and they are in a loving space and their experience has absolutely no resemblance to that. They feel very alone. And keep in mind, Lisa, most people don't get this. I've worked with so many folks who they go out and they're like, finally, I figured out why this relationship's so difficult. Mm. My partner's really narcissistic. They're, mm. They have no empathy, they're, they, they're the whole laundry list. And people are like, I don't get that. Like you look good in pictures together or it seems like you're both at the dinner together. And so it's this people not getting mm. it. Like, well, it can't be that bad. Can't you just explain to them what's going on? <laughs> no, because they're not listening. And that's hard. Imagine a child, a child growing up with parents who never see them, who never hear them, when I say see them, like notice them, mm. never hear them, never have empathy for them, never have interest for them. A lot of people grow up like that. Now jump that into an adult relationship. It takes a tremendous toll on a child. As an adult, you're not immune to those same effects, especially in what feels like it's supposed to be your primary close relationship. Mm. Yeah, God. And how many of people though actually in those 30, 40s, because you said some people stay like for the rest of their mm -hmm. life, 
still try and change them because I I love it when you're like you can't change you can't. them. But how many people just like yes, but if I only did this and mm -hmm. is that how much of that is why mm -hmm. people stay in those relationships? Well, there's there's kind of a standard. There's a short list of reasons people stay in the relationships: hope, fear, guilt, and lack of information. Okay. Hope that it'll change. I mean, we've thrown that hope out. Yeah. Fear of being alone. Some people say that the devil I know is better than the angel I don't. Like they're saying, I know this. I know how this works. I know our respective families. I have a routine. They're scared. They're scared. They're scared of living alone. They're scared of um, having their role in society change. They're scared of no longer perhaps being in a marriage or something like that. Then there's guilt. Remember, not all narcissism is just the big exploitative grandiose person like kind of holding court and sucking all the oxygen out of the room. In many cases, narciss there's what we call vulnerable narcissism. And that's more of this sort of sullen, resentful, angry, victimized form of narcissism. Mm -hmm. So instead of the entitlement coming out as, hey, I should be the VIP in the line, the entitlement comes out more as Nothing ever works out for me. I deserve so much more because I'm such a smart person. It makes me sick to watch all these other people succeeding when I'm so much smarter. See, that's a different feel of entitlement, right? Mm -hmm. And no, that vulnerable narcissistic style actually takes a tremendous toll in relationships. But when people want to leave those relationships, they feel really guilty because there is this sort of very anxious, depressed feel. And then there's lack of information. The number of people out there are saying, well, maybe if I just learn to communicate, maybe if we go to a couple's retreat, maybe if we do this, maybe if we do that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're about to spend $100,000. I'm telling you for free, this is not going to change. Make your decisions accordingly. I'm not never telling anyone to leave. I'm saying mm -hmm. this. It's like a person moving to a really hot climate and wanting to wear a down parka. I'm like, that's <laughs> not going to work. You're going to have to get a new wardrobe. Like the whole, the, this is not what you think it is. That's it. Oh, good. I love that. And I've actually heard you say, speaking of the guilt thing, um, that do never empathize with a narcissist. I'm going to put I'm going to push back on that. Ah. OK, because I believe in empathy. I think empathy is something that we are losing in this world quickly. And yet it is so crucial to me to to actually saving this world, literally down to climate change. Empathy is everything. Right. The biggest thing in fact we're right now it's actually one of the videos in pre-production we're working on right now is this idea of people feeling like they have been through so much in multiple narcissistic relationships that they're they're starting to lose their empathy across the board in fact there's a name for it it's called uh, compassion fatigue mm. that we save that more for healthcare providers psychologists that kind of thing after a while there's so much empathy you can put out unless there's some coming back in right but compassion fatigue is a little different than just feeling like I'm empathied out. Like I am being treated badly every day, 20 times a day. I don't believe truly empathic people lose their empathy. I think people get worn out and they get sad mm -hmm. and they, um, they feel more isolated from people. But I actually do believe we can have tremendous, in fact, we must have tremendous empathy for narcissistic people. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we lose, our, we lose the best part of ourselves and I'll be damned if somebody who's toxic is going to be the reason the most beautiful part of myself gets turned off. And so, and I feel that for everyone, do not ever pawn that off. But empathy doesn't mean being a sucker. Mm. Empathy is understanding whatever happened in your story that brought you here, I am so sorry. And I really hope the path forward takes you to a place where you can work on this. I really do, but not on my time. Again, another brilliant suggestion sent by people who watch the channel. And they, they were basketball fans. And I'm a basketball fan, too. I think it's, a be it's such an elegant sport. And that moment, the hang time is that moment when a player is coming up to the hoop. And it almost feels like they're flying right before they put the, the ball in, in, in the basket. And th sometimes hang time feels like it's really long, like it's almost eternal if you're watching it. And they were using hang time as an analogy of that moment you're suspended and trying to figure out, like, what is this? Like, is this person really toxic? Is this really narcissistic kind of personality style? Like, what is happening here? And it's when you're continuing to give second chances, or like, maybe I'm reading this wrong, or what, what's going on here? I don't want anyone watching this thinking it's black and white. Like, one day, I've got this process. It's a process. I always say that there's the click moment. There's a moment in your mind you're with someone and you're like, 
Okay, I'm now a little uncomfortable. It's often a red flag, but it's a little more than red flags. Mm. My, by now, you've probably seen 5, 10, even 15 red flags. And it is. It's like an audible click. You're like, okay, now I'm uncomfortable. What do I do? At the moment of the audible click, people are still saying, okay, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but we're starting to step out of the room backwards. Like we're creating more and more distance. Like, okay, this isn't cool. This is not an affiliation I want. This is not a relationship I want, whatever. Slowly start stepping away. That moment of starting to identify it and then get out, that's what's being called hang time. Here's where it gets tricky. If you are the one who decides to leave a narcissistic relationship, I can guarantee you it's going to go badly. It'll always go badly. We don't always realize this, but people who, are nar who have narcissistic, difficult personality styles struggle with abandonment because it means they've lost control of the narrative. Mm -hmm. So if somebody tries to leave them, all hell's going to break loose. All hell's going to break loose. If they decide to leave you, they're just going to go. Mm -hmm. But if you decide to leave them and they don't want you leaving, you are in for the fight of your life. And this is why it's important to identify and get it out of it, get out of it early. Mm -hmm. The earlier you get out, the less the harm. But if you're in for a while and they don't want out, they, it will be an absolute mess, which is why hang time is an interesting moment because for some people during that suspension, they're hanging in there saying, how big a mess is this going to be when I leave? So some people stay because they're so afraid of the disaster that's going to ensue when they leave. And when I work with folks who are about to start, for example, embark on a divorce from a narcissist, I, I'll tell them, for as bad as you think this is about to be, it is going to be 10 times worse. We are going to battle. And I will, not, I will not soften this for you. And every single time, whether it's a marriage, whether it's workplace, whatever it is, it is it, almost like these people look shredded when it's over. And a couple of them have said, I'm so glad I'm out. But had I really known how bad this was going to be, I don't know that I would have had the courage to do this. Ooh, okay, so how on earth, knowing that, mm -hmm. As humans, we mm -hmm. move towards pleasure and away from pain. Mm -hmm. How do you, and I, I encourage may not be the right word, but how do you, I've got no other word, encourage those people where you're like, hey, look, this is about to get really bad, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. bad, but it's going to be worth it in the end. Yeah, I would say the word I would use is support. Like you're really supporting a person who goes through this is and I don't even, listen, I'm going to be almost cynical. I don't know that I can guarantee them it's all going to be okay in the end. Mm. I do believe they're going to be better off without this toxic energy in their life. There was actually some interesting data that was collected by uh, a, a team I work with that's based in Israel as a, a, a site that calls um, Stuff That Works. And they actually collected some data on narcissistic abuse. And one of the things that they found in, the, in, in, their, in their data was that no contact, the like, cutting the narcissist off completely is the technique that worked the best for mm. people to heal. Like no contact in like that. Done. We're done. Like you, you, I, you are not Rip to contact me. Off. Done. All right. That finding made me both really happy and really sad. Mm. Made me happy because I'm like, okay, this works. It made me sad because it's a technique not accessible to many people. Does that make sense? Not everyone can go no contact for a whole range of reasons. Mm. And so when you, when you really, really step back and think about if you've ever known someone who's difficult or toxic, when they were out of your life, everything got a lot easier. There's no way to soft pedal that, mm. right? And so not getting yelled at, not getting screamed at, not getting angry emails, not getting angry texts, not getting angry, 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 and all the other abuse and victimhood and all the other stuff they're piling on, right? To be away from that, anyone is going to be relieved. So I'll tell folks, I want you to close your eyes and imagine what it would be like to not get messages from them for a week. And people almost look like, you think you put them on the beach in Hawaii. They're like, <laughs> oh my gosh. I said, okay, hold that, hold that feeling. And then, um, and I'll say, but this is the pathway to get, get to this, okay? It's terrifying. In some of the, in many cases, not some, many cases, people who are leaving narcissistic relationships are terrified. There's a whole range of responses to downright stalking and dangerous sort of harassment and stalking all the way down to more of the like petty comments on social media, mm. narcissist, the narcissistic person calling their friends and family members and 
kind of almost creating alliances against you. It's really, it can be really destabilizing for a person who goes through this and will find themselves, they're afraid to look at their inbox. They're afraid to even, they're afraid when their phone rings because they're thinking, or, or pings when there's a text mm -hmm. because they're, they're anxious about their social media. Some people go off completely because they're so scared of it. It is just, it's the relentlessness. And it, someone I know once said it really astutely. They said, when you're having an argument with a narcissistic person or whatever it is, email battle or text battle, whatever, they don't pause, they reload. It's like they mm -hmm. just, they come in and it just even more vitriol coming your way. And it never ends. Like it's middle of the night they're doing it. First thing in the morning, you're just, it doesn't end for folks. Whereas for most people, we're like, okay, can we just let this go? Mm -mm. Because that abandonment issue, as, as well as they lost control. For narcissistic people, it's really important for their ego to always be in control. And the idea that someone else is calling the shots does not work for them. Mm. So are there a few, um, I assume nothing is universal, but are there a few things that someone can do in those moments? Because going through that journey of leaving someone that's a narcissist, like you said, can be, you know, absolutely painstaking. Is there certain advice that is somewhat universal that, that certain people can do in those situations? So is it like, mm -hmm. um, so I've heard you say, don't tell a narcissist they're a narcissist. Never, <laughs> never. That's a big mistake. People will watch my content and say, ha, ha, ha. I've got the answer. And I'm like, no, 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 never. Because by the time it's done, they would have said, they would have convinced you that you're the narcissistic <laughs> oh, person because really? they're much better at arguing. And how dare you? And how dare you use a clinical term? And, and, and people will, mm. they will either take such a relentless attack or they will doubt themselves. And I'll say, what's the win on this? Where is the point? Because if you're doing it to intentionally hurt them, that's not good for your soul to intentionally hurt anyone. Mm. So don't do that. If it's to say, I figured you out, why do they need to get the memo? You figured them out. Make your decisions accordingly. Because it. Do, I've always found that when people have that call them out conversation, it always makes a destabilized situation even far, far worse. I say, listen, hold on to it as your secret. It's like, now I have the roadmap. Now I can see this clearly. I say, absolutely not. The other piece I tell people is that this is once you come into the revelation that these patterns are really cons the, the, like again we talked about it in the previous time mm -hmm. i was on the show the lack of empathy the entitlement the grandiosity the arrogance the sensitivity to criticism the constant need for admiration and validation the sense of always being a victim the sense that everyone's out to get them all of those are very classically narcissistic things and patterns once you're pretty clear that this is what you're doing dealing with no matter what you do it never changes it's always the same, however you say it, on and on and on. You're being manipulated, you're being gaslighted and everything. You don't need to make a decision immediately. A lot of you are like, well, now that I know this, I got to go away. Mm. No, get your ducks in line. If it's a, if it's a workplace situation, if it's a um, divorce, you're going to need documentation. You need to make sure you have good financial records that in many cases money is hidden. In fact, I'd say in a majority of cases, people hide money in these kinds of situations. So you need a good attorney. It often doesn't always work to do this in a mediation, that you actually need an attorney to do the good fight because a narcissistic person will usually try to hijack the mediation. And people are so traumatized and so confused by these relationships, they're really not in a good position to be their own advocate. Mm -hmm. And so it's if it's a workplace situation, you're gonna need tons of documentation if you need to file a claim or a grievance or even get out of there and not have it hurt your career in the future. So I say, make sure you're getting things documented. Absolutely make sure you're in therapy. Being supported, having a sounding board. Many people going through this have other mental health issues they're managing, depressive symptoms, anxiety. Some may turn to substances to, to manage their feelings. Some may start developing issues around food and eating. Like there's a whole host of issues we may see. People with existing mental health problems may have now an intensification. Mm -hmm. You need to be in good therapy to really walk through this, to have, again, to get as much information as you can possibly get and then recognize it's going to be a battle. I always tell people, you need to write down everything. There's actually a technique I give people, it's called the ick list, and ick as an ick. <laughs> but the ick list is this, where you write down every bad thing that's happened in the relationship. And the reason I tell people to do this is as they're getting ready to leave or the narcissistic person confuses them so much, just having that list and saying, when they're having a doubt, like, well, maybe it wasn't that bad, or. Uh, maybe I am going to stay in it. They'll read the list and say, I can't. 
I forgot this and I forgot that. And I sometimes say, you might even want to make that ick list with some of your closest people, the ones you can trust, who say, oh, do you not remember when he got drunk at your birthday party? Do you not remember that time he cheated on you when he went to Vegas? Like, did you forget these things? People don't forget them. But denial and the way our brain tries to almost cordon off traumatic memories often leads us to kind of conveniently push them to the side, like it's a storage unit where we've forgotten what we've put there. And then we're hurtling through on an incorrect set of assumptions. Oh, so you said something, I didn't want to interrupt you, but how do you get your friend mm -hmm. to say that when a lot of people, if they go through a breakup, they turn to their friends, their friends are like, yeah, he's, he's terrible, mm -hmm. you need to leave him, oh my God, I'm so glad. And then they end up not leaving them. And now they almost don't talk to the friend because the friend doesn't like the partner. And so how do you encourage yep. friends to speak up in those moments, remind yep. you of those things, because the fear is they're going to come back to you after and be like, right. oh, I'm staying with them and now I'm not talking to you. I'd have a very different kind of a conversation about it. And I have actually known a few people who will say, as the friend of the person in the narcissistic mm -hmm. relationship, if they go back, I have to cut out of this friendship because I can't watch this anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like watching a horror film. They're like, mm -hmm. I can't watch this anymore. Um, and you know what? That friendship will come back together if and when the day comes they ever leave this person. But I wouldn't make it about this is such a this is such a bad guy, this is such a bad person. Make it more about the events. Oh. The, the at literal episodes. And even in that ick list, I tell people these are about the episodes that happened in this mm. relationship. The things, the behaviors, not the what a bad person, but the, you know, the um, inappropriate text with somebody at work. The um mm. you know, the constant criticism of your family the making you know the leaving a really important work event where you were going to get an, an award early people get this stuff mm -hmm. most people don't keep those kinds of journals and by generating that ick list and i i don't disagree with you that if you bring in your friends then you may get mad at your friends well that's something you need to work on your your friends try to do you a proper mm -hmm. by saying i don't feel like this is healthy i don't feel like this is good healthy friendships are going to be able to withstand this. They really, really are. Mm -hmm. They'll say, okay, I know that you told me this. I get why you're staying. I love you. I'm here. And we, I can talk about it. Like good people can actually kind of be able to go shape shift and say, if this is what makes you happy, I can be here for you. And I shared those things with you because I, I observed them, right? I could say that I saw this happen. That was not an okay thing. That is mu very different than he's a bad guy. Mm, yeah, it makes such a difference, mm -hmm. you're right, yeah. 100%. Um, in everything we're saying, there's a lot of the language the, um, the narcissist uses. And a lot of it is manipulative, demeaning. Mm -hmm. um, how do you advise people to respond in those moments? It's a great question because it's not as simple as somebody says that to you and you get up and walk out of right. a room, right? You almost need a transitional phrase. The ones I offer are kind of inane. They're things like, I see, got it, okay, all right. Um, that's hard to hear, but okay. And just you give a transition and say, I gotta step out for a little bit, or I'm gonna just gonna I'm gonna run to the bathroom, or I'm you know I think I think we're good here for mm. now. Like I'm, I'm, it's just you're giving a sort of a transitional sign off and get yourself out of that situation. Imagine you were in a room. And somebody was singing, swinging a sword around and slashing you up a bit and getting close to you. Would you stay in that room? No. Hell no. You'd leave. Why would it be any different if somebody's saying, think of it as someone's just swinging this machete or sword mm. at you. You would say, I got it. This is not safe for me. Now, you wouldn't, may not say to someone, this is not safe for me. I always really encourage people, watch things like your tone, watch your volume. Don't escalate with them. Don't say, how dare you? Mm. No, none of that. Okay, so you almost want to think like a hostage negotiator. They don't start screaming at people. They actually break to keep their volume really, really steady. Okay, like they're trying to talk someone down, trying to talk someone out of a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so you keep it steady and you say things like, okay. I see. What if they really upset you? Still just like take Try a deep breath. Try to get out as soon as possible. Like take a deep breath because what you don't want them to see is you cry. Oh. Save those tears for the bathroom. Save those tears for the drive you're about to take. Save those tears for a walk, not in front of them. Why is that? They'll weaponize them. 
Oh, baby, baby, really, you can't take a little thing? I am so tired of your disgusting weakness. Mm. Is that what you want to hear when you're crying? No. No, I take get out. Take your weakness and get out. And when I say weakness, I don't mean that in a bad way. Right. I mean your vulnerability. Yeah. Get out of that situation. Because I think that's the issue. You don't want to serve up your pain to somebody who's going to melt it into bullets. You don't want to serve up the pain to someone who's going to melt it into bullets. How often do we do that and not realize it? All the time. All the time. I think that, and this is where we talk about that hope of the narcissistic relationship, right? right? I am going to show my pain. I am going to sob. I'm going to anguish. And here's where it gets really confusing. In some cases, when people fall to their knees and they wail and they sob, it's as though that level of, if you will, degradation is what the narcissistic person wants. They do want they it. They want it. It's because now it's like to them, they're like, you're, they have contempt for your emotion. They're disgusted by you, but they're like, Ugh, get up off the floor. It's very contemptuous. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that for some people who are really stuck in these trauma-bonded cycles with narcissistic people, they may not want out. So they're sobbing and wailing on the floor and like, oh, they didn't kick me out. And you can see how this cycle of like, almost like showing this almost degraded emotion, this humiliating emotion in front of the narcissistic person is like their prize mm -hmm. because it keeps you here and them here. Mm -hmm. All, you know, the, the, the primary motivations of these difficult relationships are the narcissistic or difficult person wants power, they want control, um, they want everything for their own pleasure, their own needs, and they're almost getting a little bit of enjoyment, like, ha, 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 so mm -hmm. weak. Because for them, it keeps their, because we talked about in that previous episode with you, what the core of the narcissistic personality is inade inadequacy, these big feelings of inadequacy and insecurity. So anything that brings those inadequacies to the surface brings up a lot of shame for them. And when they feel shame, they rage. Mm -hmm. So if you're wailing on the ground and crying or moaning or sobbing in front of them, their inadequacy stuff gets totally pushed into the background because now they feel strong and powerful on your back, on your pain is actually being used for them as fuel for their ego. Mm -hmm. That's not healthy. Yeah, so it really is a power dynamic between the two. And any time you are either equal mm -hmm. above them, that's when that is the trigger for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so if there's, like, let's say you come home and say, oh, I got this promotion. Mm -hmm. And because of this promotion, you know what, we're going to be making the same amount. This is great. It doesn't mean, like, I'm going to have to commute a little longer. That, which that's what I was saying. Remember I was saying, don't share your good news. Mm. Your good news, nine times out of ten, will trigger the narcissistic person's feeling of, of inadequacy. And then they feel shame and then they rage. So is communication, does it always then need to be surface level? Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Yeah. Always? Yeah. Always, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. And so where it gets confusing is many people with narcissistic personalities are very smart. They'll know a lot about one thing. Mm. They'll often be well read. I mean, this is what's so, such a confusing style. It's a very high functioning, dysfunctional personality style, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So you'll think you're having a deep conversation with them because you go deep on a topic, right? You have this deep philosophical conversation with them. But it's not really a personal conversation. It's almost like a theoretical conversation. Mm -hmm. But then people will confuse that, thinking, oh, we're having these deep conversations. So I'm going to talk about myself, my stuff, my story. Well, that's what they want you to do. Again, they're going to use those vulnerabilities against mm -hmm. you down the road. But it's not a deep conversation. Now, sometimes the narcissistic person will tell you what they are saying are vulnerable things about them to draw your vulnerabilities out. Either theirs aren't true, so you've been kind of given a sham vulnerability, if you will, or a, um, a thing they know, and people confuse that because the conversation will go on for hours and hours. Or they'll share a lot about their dreams and their aspirations, right? Like, I'm going to be a this and I'm going to do a that. And I, it's all very grandiose, which feels sherry, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So if I was, you know, or I was sharing, hey, you know, Lisa, I'm excited. I want to do this, this, that, and the other. And you'd say, well, I don't think that's really going to be very possible. 
that's often what the narcissist. So if you mm. sometimes, if you would ever give them that feedback, they'd lose it. But if you share your dreams, they will often give you that feedback, just as they're going on about their whole grandiose prancing about talking about I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. So then you feel emboldened to share your dreams and they'll laugh at yours. I was literally about to ask you, what's the difference about someone just kind of warning you like, oh, you may want to be careful because sometimes I think people warning you of something is like, oh, okay, there might be some gems in here. They might actually be right and there might be a warning here of like, oh, you may be careful there. So I was going to ask, how do you know when someone's genuinely cares about you and is warning you because they care about you? versus warning you because you make them feel bad. And I think you just answered because you said they laugh at you. They'll, and they'll have contempt for it. Like, oh, please. Ah. You know, versus, wow, you know, I've actually worked in that industry. And one thing I would actually highly mm. recommend is that, you know, that's such a cool idea. However, I do have a concern that if you do it this way, and they're good pieces of guidance, even though you might think like what they're saying is probably not realistic, I don't think it's anyone's place out there to piss all over someone else's dreams. <laughs> now, unless they want to hire a consultant to do that, and then that's a different, that's a financially brokered kind of a relationship, mm. right? Mm. But the idea that um, if somebody shares with you, especially in a new friendship or a new intimate space, mm. you're probably not the person who should be doing that. But it is the contempt that's mm. the ringer. Yeah. That word really mm -hmm. hits me. Um, so what do you do in those moments? Because Again, it just feels really shitty. You've just shared your dream with someone. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. I'm so excited. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. what do yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. I go back to like, I want to almost talk to them, like um, discuss it or like try and persuade them. There's no point in talking to someone contemptuous. If we could convince everyone that your dreams, your aspirations are s sacred spaces within mm. you, why would you put that sacred space in front of somebody who's having contempt for it? It's sacrilegious, right? If you want to put it that way. It's a really divine, important part of you. And to recognize they're not able to be present with this. I need to find a more worthy audience. Mm. That this is not the person to, because you will never convince them. Because mm. baiting is a huge part of the narcissistic relationship dynamic. They want the fight. You know, it's, they're prize fighters. They they know how to fight. The rest of us really kind of don't. Mm -hmm. And so they will bait you. They will be like, really? Do you think that's going to happen? Or like, come on. Or like, boy, you sure do like to talk about yourself. When you're not even a person who likes to talk about themselves, mm -hmm. but someone else at a gathering um, might say, and I remember this happening to me once in the presence of a narcissistic person. I was at a gathering, and I'm not, I'm not going to be the one who's going to yammer on about herself. It's not my way. And then somebody said, hey, I saw you're doing this cool thing. Can you talk a little bit about it? And I was like, oh, sure. You know, I, I was playing it down like, oh, it's nothing. And interestingly, as I was just about to share it, someone who was quite narcissistic in that room said, oh, here we go, getting to hear from her. And I was hurt. Like, I, it hurt. And I said, yeah, it's not that big a deal. Like, I'm just going there and I'm doing this thing, blah, blah, blah. So I minimized it because I was not at all going to give that. That narcissist mm -hmm. was looking for the fight. Later in that event, I got that person one on one and say, I'd love I, I'd, I'd be happy to share with you what I'm going to do. The big question becomes, Lisa, is in a milieu like that, in a situation like that, do people notice that whole dance, right? Watching someone get shut down by somebody who's so antagonistic. And I went with it. I did not say, wait a minute. There's a I didn't. I was mm. no. That's the baiting. You don't take the fight because they want you to take the fight. Right. I am like, I am not giving you the satisfaction because me taking the bait is you getting your validation and that is not happening mm -hmm. on my watch. Mm -hmm. But that also takes confidence in that moment to go, yeah, you know what, it's not a big deal. And confidence because you're not demeaning yourself. Right, right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, having mm -hmm. known you as much as I do now, mm -hmm. it's like I know that you, it's freaking awesome, like what you're doing. And, but, because sometimes it's, I think it's dangerous when you say, oh, what I'm doing isn't that big a deal, mm -hmm. right? It, like, right. It, it is. I think, it, yeah, it can be, and it can affect your self-talk. And unfortunately, that is my self-talk. It's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not all that. I'm not that important. I'm not that valuable. That's very much my, because I've, I've been, I mean, you don't do what I do without having been through, you know, this, this narcissistic territory and being hurt by people mm. like this more than a few times. So my tendency is to not be like, oh, aren't I great? I'm doing all this stuff. So in that situation, when that happened, actually a bit of hurt got activated in me. But at the same time, I have my toolbox and I think I'm not giving this, I'm not taking this person's bait. But I did know that the person who asked the original question was genuinely interested. Mm. So when I got private time with her, mm. 
I said, I, you know what, now that it's just the two of us, I'd love to share with you more about what I'm doing and just do it that way. Thank you for sharing that because that's actually really beautiful to hear that, you know, even when you know everything mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you don't get triggered, doesn't mean that it doesn't sting, all the time. doesn't mean that it doesn't actually go. I still get played. Yeah. Girl, I get all, I played all the time. I just got played recently. Like I get played and I get played hard. Like, and I, and I realize, like, how, Romani? Are you getting played mm. this far into the game? And I know what it is. It's a, when I view somebody as, I, for lack of a better way, when I feel bad for them. Does that almost pity? I guess maybe that's the word I'm yeah. looking for. When I pity someone, I do tend to keep trying, even when I'm feeling red flags. And that's something I've got to work on because it's actually trying to take care of people I pity has actually resulted in me getting harmed. So I am very, I have to catch that one. And if I sense that somebody's sort of pitiful to me, I've got to cut bait mm. because that has gotten me into probably most of the really horrible narcissistic situations. Not all of them, but a lot of them. It, it, it pulls for pity. There's something almost pitiful and pathetic and they're trying too hard and they're often not good at what they're doing I'm like because I, I was that person right I was once the kid who just wasn't always that good and I would have loved it if somebody you know would have had my back so I think it's you were, I think we're all, a lot of us spend a lot of our lives trying to rescue the childlike versions of ourselves our child versions and when we see it manifested in someone I think we want to rescue before we catch ourselves and say I'm not a child I'm an adult I got her I got my child version and I don't need to let pity be what drives a human relationship that was a ton of bricks right there because mm -hmm. again like i even myself i look at him and i'm like you know so much you're so knowledgeable yeah, no. on this subject i bet you never get tricked by not i bet you the literally they walk around like a big red dot and you yep. see them so it's actually beautiful and wonderful that you said that yeah because i, yeah. I really do think that it's never one and done. Even when we like oh, anything no, mindset, anything no. partners spotting to no. all of this we're talking about and I think that that's important to know because mm -hmm. I do worry that some people beat themselves up oh, over going, yeah. I can't believe I ended up with a narcissist mm -hmm. again. I've watched all her videos and I'm still yeah. falling in this mm -hmm. trap. Mm -hmm. So like you even saying that, I think just gives grace to other people. Absolutely. There's so much shame and self-blame in this space. Like the number of folks have said to me, I am so embarrassed and humiliated that I let mm -hmm. this happen. Mm -hmm. I'm saying something, you're blaming yourself for someone harming you. And so but people say, I should have known this. No, because you've got to remember, we carry this whole map of our lives inside of us. And that map isn't always good. It's like, I think every one of us, our, our compasses are a little bit off, right? Because of the things, the bad things have happened to us, the hurts we've incurred. So we don't, we don't always get to make the, we don't, we don't always make the best choices for ourselves. And people feel foolish, especially if it happens to them more than once, right. right? Like, how do I keep doing this? And it really is that your willingness to do that deep dive, like what are the illusions and the delusions we fall into? Take responsibility for those. Try to find out where they come from. But somebody abusing you is never your fault. Girl, I could keep going. I honestly could. Where can people find you? You're freaking, you're putting out videos every, every day. day now. This every is day. insane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where can people find all of that yeah. amazing stuff? So you can go, my YouTube's a great place to start because there is content coming out every day. And if there's anything you want to know about this, it's probably or, already there. And if mm -hmm. you go subscribe to the channel and also get the notifications every day when it comes out, a lot of people say this is sort of my morning coffee thing that I do. <laughs> um, I have a website, drromani.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-R-A-M-A-N-I.com. And there's a sort of like a is everything in one place links to interesting articles and important things to know and to videos and even other things that are related to the topic upcoming seminars that we have all of that is available there and so those would be the two places i would lead you can follow me on instagram and follow me on facebook we have you know pretty regular content coming out there sharing other good stuff that people are putting out because there's a lot of p interesting people doing interesting work if not specifically in narcissism even in areas like domestic abuse and all mm. of that that are all related to this topic yeah guys 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 you have got to go check her out honestly be prepared because you're going to go through a really really deep rabbit hole once you start i'm just warning you now 
but you've got to go check out her stuff. And if this episode brought you value, please, please do share, like, click that subscribe button down there. And if you're not following me, guys, what are you doing? Follow me at lisavillu.com. Oh, shit. I've now got a website, in fact, lisavillu.com. I literally would say. So go over to there. I'm so happy that I got a website. And follow me at on Instagram at lisavillu. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. What up guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of badassery, make sure you watch this video right here because I know you like it. But hey, also, while you're here guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And of course, until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.